I'm Brandon Dawson, and this is The Distiller, a podcast about how we find meaningful work and how we find meaning in the work we do. My guests for this episode are Justin and Tasha Golden. Justin and Tasha are the founders and the principal members of the band Ellery, but that's not really why we're talking with them today. Although they founded Ellery in the early 2000s in Cincinnati, a lot has changed in their lives since then, including taking an extended hiatus from Ellery, during which time they both pursued independent careers and interests and actually ended up moving from Cincinnati to Louisville, which is really why I wanted to talk to them. Uh, In our second episode, we interviewed Dom and Judy Lopresti of Spun Bicycles about the challenges of running a small business together as a couple. In this episode, I wanted to explore what happens when your professional endeavors start out together working and recording together, touring together, and then separate. What impact does the change in vocation have on the relationship? And how do you explore that together along the way? The other question is a question of choice. As you'll hear, Tasha and Justin didn't stop recording and touring because they necessarily wanted to. They did so because they had to. So what happens to your conception of meaningful work or just work in general when the only thing you ever really wanted to do is taken away from you? and you can't do it anymore. We are on the road for this episode, branching out a bit from our normal Cincinnati haunts. I uh, met Justin and Tasha just down the road from the University of Louisville campus at Monic Beer Company in Louisville, one of their favorite haunts. Monic is a great place. It's warm, welcoming, filled with natural wood and lower light. The beer is delicious, the food is fantastic, and Nick and the whole crew at Monic could not have been more welcoming and attentive. So let's get into it. Recorded live at Monic Beer Company in Louisville, Kentucky. Here's my conversation with Justin and Tasha Golden on The Distiller. Cheers. Cheers, Hi. Brandon. Cheers, Goldens. Welcome Cheers. to The Distiller Podcast. <laughs> Thank you, It's Brandon. great to see Thank both you. of you. And uh, it is a little loud, we should say. It's Friday afternoon. We're at Monic Brewing Company in Louisville. And normally... This is a nice, quiet time, but there's a giant party mm. in the other room. There is. So you're going to hear the sounds of celebration and jubilation. That's right. And, it, and it's all good. <laughs> we'll see how it sounds. We'll see how it sounds after the fact. Yeah, right? it's going to it's gonna all, the, for the all listener, be it's, wonderful. It's really lovely. It is a pleasure to have you both on the show. Thank you for, for making you. the time. Thank you, Brandon. To appear. We're going to start out as we often do, and I'm going to ask you both. I have, I have an agenda. I have things I want to ask you, but I want to ask <laughs> you both what you currently do for a living. And that might just be a title and it might be a list of things you do. We'll start with Tasha. Oh, God. Um, uh, and not, for a living is the wrong word. What you do, what do professionally, I do with my time? what you do vocationally, how you spend your days and what you do with your time. Mm. Well, right now I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Louisville. So I'm researching um, public health and a lot of things with health equity and the arts and public health. And I also do identify as an artist and songwriter, so I still try to have that thing happening in my life, although I'm nearing the end of a dissertation, so it's sort of not happening right now. And and poet, and published poet. Yeah, thank you. There you go. All right, and Justin? I'm I'm aware of, sometimes it feels like many hats. No, I think the the majority of what I do falls under... Um, audio engineering or um, music production of some type. I work a lot with, um, uh, right now, I guess I've been doing a lot more work mixing um, uh, production for uh, post-production mixing TV show kinds of things, but also doing a lot of things of mixing bands and producing records with people and and trying to take care with audio things i guess and it should be said Mm. mixes the distiller podcast that's right and makes it sound i'm cheating yeah it is totally uh maybe the word incestuous is a little heavy (laughs) but it it is a little self-serving to talk to you because i i know what you do (laughs) so here's some things that i want to talk about because um it's a conversation about work and so i want to talk to you both about the work that you do but one of the things that i love to talk to uh, partners, whether they be couples or just professional partners, about is is how they work together and how they negotiate that relationship. So uh, you both are in. Is it is it accurate to still say in? Are yeah. in Ellery yes. is still a thing? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. 
For for many years, you have had the band Ellery and uh-huh. have produced a lot of music and run, written a lot of wonderful songs. And uh, it, it should be said here at the start, um, we will link to all of this. We will link to uh, Ellery's music and to Tasha's poetry and to some of the work that Justin has done for audio. And uh, Tasha, I don't know if there are online resources that talk about some of the amazing work that you're doing. <laughs> there are. Yeah, okay. thank you. So we will link to all of that. So go to the website. But uh, I first came to know you guys uh, as Ellery. And how long you toured and really were sort of like aggressive with Ellery for how many years? I think that we were full time for six or seven years. Mm-hmm. And our first official record came out in 2005. Okay. And then at a certain point, you decided that that was not the priority anymore. I think, uh, well, I'll let you tell as much as you want about what the reasons were for that. Yeah. Well, I think that it was decided for me, <laughs> to be honest. I, um, we recorded a record in 2009. It was our most ambitious sort of project up to that point with a really fabulous producer named Malcolm Byrne in New York. And um, we were getting ready to tour to support that record. You know, we recorded it in the summer and we went on tour in the fall to try to like build up momentum for it to release the next spring. And um, I just had a really serious bout of severe depression. And um, we made it through the end of the tour, but I basically came home and got into bed and didn't get out for a few weeks or more. So um, at the end of the year, yeah, at the end of the year. And we had some very kind friends who were like, you know what, maybe you could like not be on the road for a little bit. And um, (laughs) at the time, that sounded like the most scary, devastating thing, because I thought, you know, and this is a clue to the problem at the time, but I thought my anxiety as an artist was like, if I leave this work, everyone will forget about me and my work won't won't mean anything anymore and I'll be a failure. I have to constantly be out on the road in order to be legitimate. And um, so they were like, well, maybe if you gave it like six months or something. And um, Hmm. anyway, in the course of that time, I wound up applying to go to grad school to study poetry, which is something I never thought that I would do. And I think being off the road, I was like, wait, I think this is probably good. This Hmm. is probably good. Mm -hmm. And um, didn't want to go back to the uncertainty and anxiety that that touring had been for me that I didn't even realize in the moment it was. I, I had to sort of like have the kind of really serious breakdown and then get away from it for a bit to be like, oh, that was, that was pretty unhealthy for me. So. Right. And you know, it's something that you had wanted to do forever yeah. since you were young and since I was to, little. Yeah. To come yeah. to the point of saying on the one hand, maybe this isn't something that I should do. And on the other hand, maybe I'm okay if I don't do it. Yeah, it's like, this is the one thing that I've ever, only thing that I've ever wanted to do with my life. So if I don't do this, what the heck am I and what am I going to do? Because it made it terrifying to to stop. And I think that the recognition of like, whether like, I'm okay or not after that, I think probably took years. (laughs) I think it was probably a time. And it, you know, in waves, there's interesting things for us in terms of passing of time, because that was, I think that was you know, the beginning of 2010, that was also like right about when we were both 30. So we'd Mm -hmm. spent our 20s, you know, doing this and had this big shift and kind of entered that new year of like, we don't know how we're going to make any living. Tasha, one thing, like she said, was just like a thing that I think that was important for us was just like that that depression and those things, uh, especially afterwards, being able to look back, recognizing was a long it stretched long into that that time in our 20s and was also, I think, recognizing, I don't know, like the, the, the differentness that we pursued after that. Like, I remember that spring, Tasha went and just worked, like, did some volunteering at a horse farm near us and, oh, yeah. you know, watched <laughs> oh. lots of The Dog Whisperer. And <laughs> so every season of Caesar Milan. Fantastic. Yeah, that's right. Where at the end of the show, good everything is solved. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you're right. And that was very Tie it off with a neat time. bow. Yeah. Well, how relaxing. did you, because that's, it's one thing for you to take care of yourself and do what you need to do for your mental health. It's another for you to make the decision to stop doing what you've done. And then it's, uh, I would imagine, a wholly other thing for the two of you to talk about that and make that decision together. And Justin, for you to say, this is our livelihood. This is not just 
your career, this is our career. How did you guys discuss that together and negotiate that? It was really, I think it was really difficult because I think that how we came to doing music was we started playing music together as friends and kind of came to have a relationship through that, interests in other people waned and interest in each other. And so I think that we built a lot of who we were about that band or about what we were doing in, in that relationship and things were really It was all tied, knotted up together, yeah. yeah. Yeah, all tied up together. And I think that that time of coming off the road, as it were, was also it was a time a lot of about starting to untangle from each other and like, who are we and what are we doing? And it was a really, I don't know, it was very, it was very, it was very strange and challenging because I felt there was a, a very real way of saying uh, it was a lot of uh, not just uncertainty, but but uh, a kind of unmoored feeling of like, I don't have any idea who I am or what I'm doing. And I'm not sure if what I was doing makes any sense <laughs> or uh, it, it was a, there was a lot yeah. of it, it. And it wasn't really something necessarily even that we decided together. It was something that was very much more from the place of this needs to happen yeah. for yeah. healthiness. But uh, a thing to come to realize later was beginning to understand that it, it wasn't a it wasn't a healthy thing, even how we were relating to each other and, mm. and, and uh, to ourselves. Yeah. So you're working through that. You didn't, you know, you didn't make that shift with, okay, now we know what we're going to do <laughs> next. It was, we don't do this thing anymore. The only thing that we've ever done. Right. For both of you. Right. I, I, I would like to hear a little bit about that next phase. And that phase maybe is still ongoing. But like uh, starting with you, Tasha, at what point? You said you applied to graduate school. Yeah. You had already applied for graduate school when you made the decision to stop touring? or <laughs> No, I was, I think, in a moment, like laying in bed with a laptop, like reaching out to previous mentors or whatever. One of them had just said like, I think that you would really do well in academia. There's like a lot of predictability and you like you like you're a thinker and um still give big props to my friend Kelly for 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 talking me through some different things. And I sent out one application to the closest university to me because I knew I wasn't gonna move. I didn't have any idea what I was doing. And I wasn't I was applying to a poetry program and I wasn't a poet, I just wrote songs a lot and um so I sent them a CD, I sent them song lyrics, I sent them a couple hacks at a poem. Um, so I was surprised as anybody that I got in and then I was sort of, I remember getting the phone call and then being like, oh shoot, well now I have to figure out if this is what I'm going to do for the next two years. Um, and that felt even scarier because I had given myself like several months. Um, and then if I were like, okay, I'm not going to do this for two years. And like, what if some, suddenly some really cool tour called and we had this opportunity and what would happen? And, um, so, but I think that the great thing about that that I couldn't have seen at the time is that that process of being in a program for two years gave us a stability that I needed of like, okay, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. It's going to take this amount of time. I don't really know exactly why I'm doing it, but it's obviously going to feed into my songwriting and maybe that's useful over time. And it totally was. I wrote completely different songs after that than I did beforehand, wrote way more often and more songs than I had beforehand. Um, I just didn't expect to, like, by the end of it, be like, you know what I love is research. <laughs> <laughs> Which so, you found, yeah. Makes perfect yes, sense. Yes. Who, who knew? I couldn't have known. So We okay. joke about the, 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 you know, Tasha per perceiving herself as an artist an art and, and an artist being, you know, partly defined by someone who just, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> loves spontaneity and, and you know, and, and and all these kinds of things. And 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 I remember pretty early on feeling like Tasha saying like, "No, I love, you know, no, no, actually, I hate that. I, I love like you know routine, and I love like being home. And I, oh no, like yes, I thought that I was like you know." Just go with the wind. You're an artist. Everything is beautiful. And I'm like, actually, as it turns out, I'm super left-brained and I really love research and I really like my routines and I like to eat the same things every day and I am just not this stereotype of an artist yeah. that I thought that I was. Well, So, like, brief bookmark <laughs> because the cultural discussion around 
doing what you want to do. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, we were talking this week around a blog post that I'm going to be publishing on on the website, and part of the discussion around work and how we think about work and a big part of it in the United States these days is follow your passion. Mm. You know, and and a couple of interesting things come to mind. Number one is what happens when you can't. Like what happens when your body and your brain and your chemistry. And, and maybe just your personality uh, like won't let you do the thing that you actually think is your passion mm. and how you deal with that. And then the other thing is like maybe your passion is a thing that progressively reveals itself to you over time. Maybe like maybe we don't know what that is and we find that out. There's no questions behind this. I'm just thinking about, <laughs> about yeah. you because yeah. the, it would have been like, no, Tasha, you need to hold on. Right. <laughs> to your songwriting dream with everything, but it's like at I what expense. Yeah. yeah. I, I did, I did for, we had lock, all kinds of questions that at this point seem irrational. Like, um, am I a real artist if I'm not making my money from my art? If I'm a, mm. Am I legitimate in the eyes of like all my fans if I'm not putting out a record every year, every couple years, and if I'm not showing up in their town? And will they hate me and think that I've sold out to something? And um, all these questions that at this point are, seemed to me very, very silly, but they were very anxiety inducing and really yeah. difficult and um, terrifying at the time. And I felt a lot of shame. Um, there's a lot of people who feel shame around pursuing an art. I felt a lot of shame around leaving it behind. I thought that that was the shame that I was encountering. Um, and then not knowing that there's art in all kinds of things and there can't, like you're saying, there can be passion in all kinds of things. And I am very aware, especially because of my work now with equity issues and, and things like that, that there's a lot of people who don't get a choice in what they do. And so putting so much um, yeah. emphasis on identity associated with work and stuff like that kind of leaves out all of the people in the around the globe who don't get a choice with their vocation yeah. or who cannot make those connections. And um, I think I found a lot of interest and curiosity and solace in recognizing that um, we're all trying to do the best that we can with the resources that we have and the bodies that we have and uh, that we have to be honest about the limitations that we face in any of them. So Justin, what did you do when you, you guys aren't on the road anymore? You're not we, doing this. Tash is in bed. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> what are you doing right then? Real way. I, I, I was really, um, I feel very fortunate. I, I knew a friend. I was trying to think of like, what are, what's a job that I could do that still connects with some creativity or whatever. And I had, we had met um, a person named uh, Ben Nicholson who worked at a, a, a post-production house in Cincinnati called Lightborn. Mm -hmm. And um, I applied for a job there and, and I ended up working as a, in a production assistant and started doing a lot of things. And over the next five years, I worked at that, uh, I worked at that place and, and, and I, I, you know, it started from like, all right, I need to find a job. I, you know, T Tasha needs some help in kind of a way. And it seemed like it made sense of, okay, well, what, what else can I do? And so I, I kind of, I don't know, I, 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 I struck out. I'm really, I feel really grateful that that came along because I felt very, I felt very inadequate and had no idea what, what I should do, what I could be doing. Um, but I think there was also the recognition of, how things needed to change and the ways that maybe we'd built things of identity of our roles together and, you know, individually for what those needed to be for things to be more healthy. I feel like it was kind of a reckoning yeah. that, that, that period felt like a, 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 a real reckoning of, you know, what roles we were feeling together, what that maybe looked like in the long term, what that was or wasn't helping. And so I, I went to work at this, this uh, you know, like I said, post-production house, and, and it was great. It, I mean, it was profoundly amazing. And, and a lot of immediately things that were, um, oh, here are all these things that I didn't want to do, and they were easy to maybe pass off when I was working with a partner. Oh, I'm kind of nervous about talking to people on the phone. I mean, really, you know, like mundane whatever things. I'm really nervous about talking on the phone, I'm nervous, you know, they hear these kinds of things that maybe my partner can do uh -huh. for me, but here it was just like, no, you just have to do them. And so <laughs> right. I think it was also a period of, you know, immense growth and, and, and it, but it was really amazing. And, and it became uh, something that was, you know, on one side of things was, a, became a steady income that allowed us to kind of find our feet. 
Um, but I think it was the start also of us having more individual paths and individual lives and, and individual interactions and starting to discover who we were apart from each other as well as together, who, who we were, uh, what, what we liked. Tasha's liking, I like being, you know, Tasha's liking being home or routine and my still being like, no, I like weird things and I like to just <laughs> randomly like do whatever, you know, et cetera. So um, that started the kind of like, I guess that was the, the path that my life took at that point. The, that process, because you are fundamentally very different people. I mean, that comes through, I'm sure, in just hearing people. But Tasha, you're an introvert. You're a structured person. Justin, you are like, I think I've described you before as basically Tigger. <laughs> like, you know, and that comes not, through. Not true, maybe. Like, Hopefully all, more respectful, but that doesn't. Very, very respectful. That doesn't but seem the, not true. But the energy, yeah. <laughs> yes, like yes. boundless energy and interest and passion yeah. for sort of new things. Yeah. And... You know, there, it's interesting, first of all, you had this thing that you were both doing. Right. And maybe it feeds those sides of you. The performing side feeds you maybe less than Tasha, but the creative and intense writing side feeds Tasha. And so there's a balance. Now you're not doing that anymore. Right. Now, like you said, you're having to figure these things out separately. What does that do? I've known several couples over the years that have done sure. uh, creative pursuits together, right. writing partners, mm. musical partners. That's an intense kind of a relationship. It and is. It, and it, it, not everybody can do it because it's like your work is your home is your work. There is no separation. You're Definitely. always with your creative partner and you're always doing it. Now it's the opposite. You're going to work every day. Tasha, you're figuring things out. Like what kind of strain did that put on your mm. relationship? during that time? I'm sure it put significant strains on things, but it, looking back, it feels like it opened things up in like a beautiful way. Yeah, that's I funny. Think I, that can't, I can't think of a strain necessarily <laughs> really? either. It's just not like it was just It was grinning. a confusing time, but I don't know that it was a strained time because, you know, to be honest, the work that we did as um, Ellery before that, instead of comp the Ellery complimenting both of what you know, us for what we were looking for. I think that both of us subsumed things under not the other person, but the project of Ellery, mm -hmm. of needing to make a living from it, just completely driven by um, needing to have X number of shows or sell X number of tickets because we're literally worried about whether we'd be able to pay the rent if yeah. we didn't. And that kind of uncertainty and anxiety driving the music and driving um, our project, which drove our relationship because the relationship is what drove the project. So um, I think getting out from under that, like, let us sort of be like, oh, we're people. And we had that funny time when, like, what Justin was saying, like, oh, I still really love to do all these crazy things. But Tasha's found out that she really loves to be home and realizing, like, over time, like, oh, you can just do those things and I'll stay here. That we didn't right. have to, like, um, do things all together was a funny learning time. And those that caused some, like, funny tension here and there. Yeah. Or, or, but it, it felt like a, a really wonderful growing thing as opposed to something troubling <laughs> so I, I don't want to fast forward through stuff so if there's milestones that I'm missing but you worked at Lightborn for five years yeah you enrolled in the program and were there for two years and started writing poetry eventually published a book of poems yeah and and kind of like really threw yourself into that process thinking and you you almost uh, went to get a PhD in poetry I did yeah um at, at, as that, I say almost, like why not? And what did you do and how did that develop into what you're doing now? Uh, well, I, I figured out that I really loved research and I loved academia, but I also really wanted to keep writing poems. And part of my drive to do that was I was realizing, I think a beautiful thing about depression and about severe instances like that is that you you have to you lose the pretense because you have to mm -hmm. there's something really relieving about sending an email at the beginning of that one year just a whole bunch of friends like i'm probably not gonna like write you back for a while or like call you <laughs> or if you want to see me like maybe come by but also maybe don't um <laughs> and he, here's because like i'm having this hard time and, and it was just such a relief to like hit send on that and be like mm -hmm. okay Nobody expects me to be other, uh, anything other than really broken right now because that's mm. what I am. And there was something about that process of like being in um, school for poetry too where I never thought that anybody would read those poems. So I 
suddenly was writing about all kinds of things that I had never allowed to creep into my songs, mm -hmm. but I also didn't know that I wasn't letting them into my songs. I didn't know there was anything there to explore. So I really loved that process of following these different obsessions in the poems and then putting them together. And I had found that I liked research and thinking about theory and abstract um, ideas. And so I wanted to pursue that in a PhD. But then in the middle of all that, had um, unexpectedly been invited to work with girls that were incarcerated and um, writing, uh, creative in, writing Invited workshops. how? Because this becomes a big thread, so I want to do it yeah. justice. Oh, like, yeah. how, did, how did that actually start? Uh, we were playing a show in Springfield, Ohio, as Ellery, mm -hmm. and um, they had invited us to come early for a lunch hour show to play for um, young people who were in the detention center just down the street. And we said, sure. And as a result of some of the things that we had talked about, our, our songs get into issues of domestic violence and mental illness, things that are in our histories. And we just talked with the young people about that. Mm. But kind of based on that, one of the directors asked if I would come back and do a, a writing workshop for girls the following year. And uh, I had never done anything like that. And like I said, I'm a nerd, so I loved the research. And I started <laughs> in, in researching girls in the juvenile justice system, what I found was appalling that they um, are, they have different pathways into and through the justice system than boys, yet there are not services that address their unique needs. They often have zero programs for girls and maybe programs for boys and all kinds of other issues that, um, and in higher rates of trauma and abuse histories and things like that, that I thought that the arts could help address for them. So in all of this time, I was starting to get really interested in how to develop that program and how to do it in more places. So for a while, I thought that maybe I would just do that and expand that. Um, and wound up where I am now because I realized that I was interested not just in doing the programming on the ground, but developing the theories around why it works or why it's needed, not just with this population, but with any population mm. that's been um, oppressed or marginalized in some way. And so you're, you're doing that, you don't know what it's going to become. Oh, those workshops, do you mean? Yeah. Yes. And what's going on at the time? Like you're, you finished the program the two-year program, where was that? Um, the, I, I was invited, I think, right in the middle of that. Um, or the, right at the end, 2012, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, From Miami. Yeah, the end and of Miami time. And what are you time. doing at work, around work at that time? I don't even remember. I think that I was adjunct teaching a little bit. And then I wound up teaching um, a high school literature course and, and writing course for a year. It was super fun. Shout out to my Leaves of Learning students. Um, and then trying to figure out what to do next. Like, do I do a PhD in something? And what would it be? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> what is it that I'm trying to research? What am I talking about here? Yeah. But yeah. knowing that research now is a, is a crucial component, whatever you want to do, this is becoming an increasing yes, feature of definitely. it. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. And Justin, you are still working at Lightborn or at that point, like beginning to, to move out of it? Well, uh, I, I think uh, still working at Lightborn. And I think when I, you know, my... my my heart has always been on, you know, in, in the kind of the music land of things and wanting to do, you know, different parts of that, of, you know, production or mixing or blah, blah, blah. Um, and what I didn't expect was that while at that place, there were a lot of opportunities for things like that. Getting to know, uh, you know, we, I think we started to recognize how isolated maybe we had been in, in hmm. kind of, you know, being yeah. in our little band world and traveling around and etc which is it's funny to say how isolated you had been traveling the world writing yeah. music but i get it it yeah. is yeah. true it's no, an you're insular exactly right. world even though you might be touching people you're touching them and saying goodbye and leaving and then coming home to this sort of hovel but i think people think of that as something completely different it's mm -hmm. true and, it and it was a lot of also the you know the perspective that we brought with it i mean it was so much so much that the way i think that was characterized certainly for me of really taking on I think I, I, I was really insecure and self-conscious about things. And I think that, you know, encountering from, you know, people that we are with or whatever, you know, different kinds of fears or self-consciousness about like, oh, this thing about the music that we're making, or I, I feel like I, I shouldered a lot of those mm. kinds of ideas. I felt that, I think I got to a point where I basically felt like whatever I was doing was the wrong thing. Whatever I was interested in was the wrong mm -hmm. thing. But I think that, you know, whilst working at, uh, um, Lightborn, I think uh, there was a lot of opportunities for, I had a, a, a boss who was wonderful, who but just kept pushing me into opportunities. He knew what I was really 
passionate about or I cared about. And it would be like, hey, there's opportunities for different music. And so I, I would work on those for jobs at, uh, that were a part of, as they were appropriate at, at, at our shop. Um, but as well as things outside, I, you know, met people. And I think it was starting to recognize that thing of, I think it was just a, a, a workplace where I just met other people and met people who were involved in music and met people who, you know, had needs. And, and, and hmm. recognizing, I think what came later, but what was really expressed through that was like what I really care about is taking care of people and, and hmm. maybe particularly that in a, you know, in the world of music or, or other kinds of things, but how to bring bring out what they're doing or bring, you know, how, how to... Uh, I don't know, maybe that, that way of recognizing some things about the experience that we had had and thinking of like, oh, how could that be different for, for someone who's doing music in a thing? Whether, uh, 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 whether an artist outside or, or whether a, a program or something that we were working on with Lightborn. Um, uh, um, so, so I was involved in that. I was doing a lot of work, obviously, with the stay job of Lightborn. And it, it was growing. It was really satisfying and ch- deep profoundly challenging um but also a lot of work in the evenings there was a lot of days of where i'd work at you know light from the morning till night yeah and then i would go drive somewhere and record someone from the evening until super late at night and then come back home and, and kind of start over and it was really satisfying and, and i was i was really grateful for it because it was things that i really enjoyed and it was finding a new world and a new discovering uh, I don't know, maybe discovering myself in that, like, what, what am I passionate about? Or what do I, what do I care about? I guess maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and what, what like actually matters. Yeah. What actually matters to me. Yeah. And then at a certain point you left five years at there. At a certain point I left. It's true. And there what, was, what precipitated that? I think there was a recognition of the role that I was in at, at Lightborn. I was, I was a project manager and producer I'm at the end, and I just recognized that the people there, like what they, I, I, I was doing my best, but I felt like what they really needed was someone that had a certain kind of background. It was a background that I didn't have, and it was, and I wanted the best for my team, who were just amazing, wonderful people, and for these projects. And it was difficult because I felt like I just didn't, I didn't have that. I guess I didn't ha- have what could to bring to that. Along the same time I was doing more and more music work uh, in a live context that had started growing and I think I recognized uh, there was more and more opportunity for me to continue in that and, and and I think that I had had some sense in my brain and the way that maybe anyone does of you know I think I'll work here for a time and then I'll go do more music stuff and I, that was just a thought in my head right. but so uh, there was a way that that started to become more reality of the position that I was in at Lightborn needed a more of a specific kind of person and role that a thing that I, I, I didn't feel like I could bring to that. Um, it was beyond what I could bring. Um, but I had more and more opportunity for, um, um, music and the, the, the mixing and the audio kind of work that I was doing. So I was able to kind of step out from there, uh, in, in in hindsight, do you think, because I, I talked to you sure. during that process sure, a little bit, yeah, and I yeah, know a yeah. little bit of your thought process. Do you think that was true? Like, do you really think that you didn't have the skills to do what was needed? Or do you think it was like an imposter syndrome thing? That's a great question. Where your question. lack of sort of maybe formal background led you to be less confident in your work than you needed to be? No, that's a great question. I think there are definitely things that I can look back on and that I recognize Oh, I could have been a lot more confident. There's, it's hard. I feel like I learned a lot more about the job that I was doing after I left hmm. working with other. I learned about the job of a producer after I left and worked with other producers, and I was like, oh, I get it a lot more. But I, but I do think that uh, um, someone that had come up maybe in the world of production, someone who had come up in that world and could speak to that really and knew right. it better, could could perform better. And I think there are people that have filled those roles and are really bringing some to that in, in, in really magic ways. I think. I think I recognize what I brought to it and what was special about what I did. And I, uh, and I see the, uh, the ways those things made a difference. And I think I, I recognize like how to bring those into the other things that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, um, but I, but I, I, do, I, I do think that there was, uh, I, I recognize the imposter syndrome part of it, but, but, um, mm-hmm. 
but and I, that's not to say that that mm-hmm. the move wasn't still a good idea. Oh, sure. It's just sometimes these things precipitate. No, that's a great a it, change based on maybe some maybe an understanding that's not entirely mm-hmm. true. No, I right. think and I think it was really good. I think it was a good. It was I think good it was, timing at that It was time. a good like moment of me stepping out. One thing. Yeah. A good moment of other people stepping into those roles. Mm-hmm. And I think it was deeply positive. And then you moved into more fully into music production. That's right. Into a really like just super freelance kind of way. And it's been a and that's been its own interesting thing of not just understanding what I'm doing or digging into work, like the specific work, whether that's You know, because it's been mixing people on the road, mixing, you know, sound for bands on the road, mixing or or, or doing recording projects with artists. And now, you know, mixing um, uh, along with the music making with artists, uh, mixing more things kind of for for picture, mixing things for TV and broadcast and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But but I think was a, a real it's funny. We had this time of Tasha when she was trying to decide whether to do a Ph.D. program or not. We did one of these we got a book that was like, what's, you know, what, what do you do? What's the thing that you're really interested in? Or what's the, what should you do in your life? And I was like, I don't really know about these things. And she's like, you know, but I was like, oh no, let's do this. This would be good to do together. But I felt like, oh, I'm doing this for Tasha. <laughs> but what I, the exercises were things that it had, I felt like were really clarifying to what was important to me about what I did. And that's what I think I alluded to earlier, which is, and which has been kind of a profound thing for me, but which is taking care of people in it. And I think that's, you know, and I'm expressing that in, like, in the project, how, how to anticipate the client and, like, what do they need and w- what things really address and help them. I mean, I mean, really, really obvious things sometimes that, but that seem neglected, just, like, communication or being a nice person or being like, hey, you need it today and I'll have it for you this morning or, yeah. you know, yesterday or blah, 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 blah. But just th- those kinds of things in, in whatever field and how much, how important those feel to me and feel like a I guess a center of what I'm doing and it, and, it, and and because I'm still kind of discovering like all right what's making sense right now the 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 mixing for picture has been a fairly recent thing but recognizing the through line in all of that is trying to do that like okay what do these people need you know what can best serve that and you know wanting to do a good job at all the technical like I'm super interested obviously in all the nor- you know dorky technical things but but just trying to like <laughs> provide a good experience and a good product and etc how have you, in as much detail as you're both willing to give, how how have you both sort of survived the upheaval of having, mm. I mean, you, you had a career that you were doing in which there is basically no security and very little, little <laughs> money. Right. And yes. then you lost that. Yeah. And then you did have, like, you kind of got the, the day job. Sure. But you let that go. Right. Like, how have you dealt with the financial insecurity of figuring this out over time. Because I think that's something, if somebody's listening to this and they're like, well, that's the thing that's keeping me. I would like to make changes. I would like to do different things, but God, there's no way that I could do whatever. I don't want to gloss over the fact that that had to have been a significant worry and something that you either worked out by accident or worked out intentionally in how you approach this stuff. Yeah, it's been a, a consistent worry. I think that a big part of my reckoning with depression and anxiety was realizing that a life with like financial security, insecurity, um, which is entrepreneurship, which is everything that I thought that I loved, was not something that I could do in a healthy way. And then being like, oh, well, that's what I, but you know, that's what I love. That's the artistry of it. That's the making something and not knowing and all of that, that I thought that I was really drawn to. So, um, but since then, it's really funny. There are things that can be really triggering for me now that I kind of am more cognizant of the fact that financial insecurity is deeply hard for me. Mm. When there is like, when I feel like we're hitting a time when there might be some risk or something, it's very triggering yeah. for me. So it has been really difficult. And when, you know, Justin was talking about that timing of like leaving a kind of nine to five solid workplace and doing freelance, there were a lot of conversations about like, okay, but what does this mean? Like, can you give me some numbers? And, and, you know, and part of what made that opportunity um, great is that right at that time when he was feeling like, oh, I'm not really sure if I want to be at this one place anymore, there were a string of opportunities to, you know, go on like more longer ex- extended tours or more records or things like that that did kind of have us out several months that allowed me to feel like, okay, well, this is... First of all, 
I'm going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. But then also, this is a great opportunity for Justin to do something that he's clearly wanted to do for a really long time. Yeah. yeah. It may not be the thing, but at least it's enough. Yeah. To to decrease the anxiety enough to sort of sign on to it. And it's yeah. true. And there was a like a deeply practical element to the whole thing. Like I mean, like all of the cliche kinds of things that that you would hear. But we just when when as we started to make more money, we just you know like a, it feels very cliche like forgive me but like I feel like all these things of like aggressively trying to pay off debt and just being like all right this is what we've been living at and anything that we made you know above that trying to pay off debt or trying to save what I think about a year before be, about a year before I left Lifeborn I was kind of like hey I think I want to try to leave and do music kind of stuff and as much as we looked at things it just did not make sense mm -hmm. and I worked another year and in that year we built up a ton of savings. Uh, there were a lot of, it was really hard while I was working. I was doing additional work. I would take vacation days to go do other work, to go tour, you know, with people and to mix. And I was building up that work and there was kind of a, a moment what let us step out is that we were able to like kind of look and say, all right, we made some savings and there's some other kind of work that lined up that's going to make that and let's let's take mm -hmm. a step out in that way. It was very much a step of faith. And, but you prepared. Know, I, yeah, it's true, and I and I recognize that like, I don't know, like not a not a lot of. It wasn't really people, faith. <laughs> not, a lot, not a lot of people have those opportunities, yeah. or or you know, and we feel really. I don't know. It feels kind of crazy that we were we were able to do that. It wasn't it wasn't because we were. It, I feel like it was very, just some simple things that we were trying to stick to. We weren't. It wasn't that we were super smart about all the things or. Well, but it's it's important to point out, and I, I, I like, it's kind of a trick question because sure. I know some of the answer because I know you guys mm. and it's like the People magazine article of your last 10 years <laughs> is yeah. you know is Ellery what are they doing now right oh Tash has found her way in in you know like public health right Justin's making music yeah so cool like <laughs> You, no, you know you're, what I'm saying? Like, it's right. really easy to sort of like see the high points of your process and mm. go, oh, it was, it was easy. They followed their passions. It's like, no, that's not the way it happens. Yeah, no, not it a, happens yeah, with intention and planning and hardship and having your dreams taken away from you yeah. in ways that you didn't want and weren't happy about and didn't invite yeah. and mourning and grieving for that and then figuring out like what next and saying, oh shit, well, we got to. We got to pay the bills right. somehow. Okay, I'm going to go get a job. Like that job might might have been a neat and, and somewhat sexy thing, but it was also a baseline necessity. Oh, yeah. And he didn't and, know that it was going to be neat going into oh, yeah. it. I mean, it was right. definitely right. a lot of like yeah. starting, you know, like there's a shoot where we're, you know, doing things for Long John Silver's and I'm spending my day cleaning out fryer vats. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah, a, yeah. Like, the, it's really easy to look at somebody else's process and go, oh, well, it all works out. They followed their passion and it worked. <sighs> it's so much more complicated yeah. than that. So much more intentional on yeah. your part. You looked, at, you looked at leaving this job and following your deal that you wanted to do. It wasn't time. You waited yeah. a year. You didn't wait a couple of weeks. Right. You, like, saved and paid off debts. And that, right. that care... Yeah. Of each other and of what needed to be done. Yeah. Is something that like can get lost along the way in telling the story of how somebody's life morphs over time into the thing that that they now really feel good about. Yeah. There's so, a lot of there's a lot of trying to identify like what what really matters to us and not with this like great finality or, or great you know, ah, oh, yes, we have this clear purpose, but this a lot of like vague feelings that you're kind of grasping at. And a lot of like for us to move, for Tasha to start this PhD program and, and me doing that was like, I'm going to sell all this music gear that I have. Right. And, you know, this like guitar that I really loved and, you know, a lot of things that were, mm. you know, not easy, but that when trying to put up felt like, well, you know, you know, what, what am I doing? I'm doing this other kind of thing and this is really valuable. It's valuable to take care of this person and it's difficult in the moment. And it doesn't, there was a lot of decisions I think that at the time didn't feel like a sure thing. No, no decision ever felt like a sure thing. Everything felt like kind of a vapor. And then two years later, we could look back and say, oh, I'm glad we did that. Yeah. Wow, neat. Yeah, yeah. And it, the, one of the great things 
um, too, is that uh, it's it, it, it's obvious when you sort of look at what the last, let's say, 10 years have been for you guys, that there's been a partnership of caring for each other's dreams. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, or, or maybe not even caring for each other's dreams, just caring for each other. Yeah. Like, Tasha's can't do this anymore. Yeah. That's a reality. I'm going to go out and get a thing. Yeah. We're still going to be okay. Yeah. Then... Justin goes and gets the job at a certain time. Justin's like, okay, now I'm going to do the thing that's a little bit more risky. You right. are in maybe not a lucrative position, but at least a position <laughs> yeah. where you have something set that's like the thing that you're going to do for a little while. And there's been a, gi- a good give and take that yeah. I have seen through that process of both. Yeah. It, both of, it, it's not been a story of, well, Justin's following his dreams. <laughs> For 30 years, so yeah. Tash has got to, like, you know, work the shitty job. It's like you both mm-hmm. have taken care of each other and of your dreams in the process, which is yeah. is cool in that partnership. And you know what's funny about that is that I think that for other um, people in other scenarios, that's something that we notice right away and that, that charges us in some way, like other relationships or other scenarios where we see somebody who has a dream but they can't do it because their partner is doing something different or whatever. And we'll, we'll get, we'll both of us get pretty worked up about it and maybe not even realize it until like later we're talking about it and we're like, oh, but what was, you know, like, and I think that there's something about that's really sensitive and important for both of us that, mm. um, and I think it's both like wanting to be, to be fair and to be not misrepresent myself. I think it's both my, my desire for Justin to be able to have his dreams, but also my extreme guilt if he weren't able to. So I'm, I'm nourishing both of those things. You know, it's well, not but those all... are indistinguishable often. <laughs> they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that's the honest thing. It's like, well, <laughs> it's, hard. Yeah, it's, certain, it's, it's equal parts cheerleader and crushing guilt about not letting <laughs> the other person do their thing. And that's, yeah. that's right. life. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, how what you are doing, Tasha, has morphed. So you, you applied for the PhD program at, at uh, Louisville. Yes. For... Uh, I applied to do a program in rhetoric and composition, which was because I wanted to study how the arts help us talk about difficult things. And that was something that was really stood out about my work as a musician. Like I said, we had songs about difficult topics like domestic violence, but after shows, those were always the songs that people wanted to talk about and they would come and share their yeah. own stories with me. And a yeah. lot of times those people were telling me about something and they'd never told anybody before. So I was really interested in like, if, if we know for our health that we need to be able to talk about these things, what is the role of the arts in being able to talk about these things? And I didn't know that public health was a thing that I could be researching. So, but rhetoric is housed within English, and that's where I had come from as you know, a like creative writer. And so, I pursued that um, mm-hmm. here. And then once I was here, I met some people who were in public health who were like, "Why are you not researching, you know, art and communication as it affects mm. health, but like in health?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, this is a solid question." So. Um, I wound up switching degree programs uh-huh. to be able to research the role of the arts in public health, especially addressing things that are stigmatized and especially addressing issues of cultural responsiveness and things like that with marginalized populations. And so that led to an entire shift in your major, in your department. Yeah, oh yes. goodness. So I went from an English and humanities department to a public health, health sciences department. Huge shift. <laughs> yes. But a shift, <laughs> but, a, but a shift that makes sense in retrospect, a shift that has like talk about Couldn't how make that, more sense. Yeah, how that has actually like really jived with who you are and what you're what you're continuing to do. Oh, you know, I had like a, a, a semester of imposter syndrome because I was taking all these boot camp um, master's courses that I didn't have to take because I didn't have a master's in public <laughs> health. And um, I was like, you guys, they let a songwriter into science school. Like, what's going to happen? <laughs> um, nah. But yes, I found that I really love the the... Um, even as an artist, I love knowing whether what I'm doing is doing what I think it's doing. And I think yeah. a lot of artists shy away from research because yeah. they don't want somebody to nail them down to something. But I was really driven by this idea of like, oh, but if I think I'm helping people or giving people a voice or giving an issue a voice with my art, I would love to know if that's actually happening and how can I explore that? So I became interested in that kind of circus. But I think there's this wonderful way that like after I got over the imposter syndrome, I think like having been an artist feeds scientific work in this really cool and interesting way where I'm, I am often and maybe all the time the odd person in the room, 
But I don't mind that so much because it's a... In the academic room? Yes, yeah, like yeah. especially a scientific academic room. Um, but they're not, you know, typically not opposed to what I have to say or these different <laughs> ideas. And it's often very welcome. And I've found that to be a welcoming space for... Um, the intellectual curiosity and the pursuit of truth that I've always seen art to be, science is also that. There's a lot, they're a lot more aligned than, um, than we're often taught to think they are. So I would love to hear you talk in as much detail as you want about what you're actually doing every ah, day. Okay. So I'm trying to finish a dissertation right now, so a lot of what I'm doing <laughs> is staring at a computer screen. But um, I'm researching how the arts can give us new ways to research specific issues and populations. So a lot of times if we want to know about a stigmatized issue, say, um, say domestic violence, we have these quantitative surveys that we can distribute or different ways to learn about um, domestic violence. I'm interested in what is it that people are not able to say via those surveys that they would be able to say if we gave them different communicative options. And so um, art as being one of those options, I've prototypes a few different methods for learning about populations and how they think about violence. So, and I'm comparing, my dissertation compares what I'm learning from a population via their art to what I'm learning oh, from that wow. same population what via surveys. This, and if there are differences be. and what the strengths and weaknesses of both versions are, because I don't think that I'm going to prefer one over the other. I'm just probably going to wind up right. just being able to point out what they or do they and different. what they don't do. Yeah. yeah. And are you, what are you, what are you seeing? What are you finding? Um, <laughs> well, I'm in the middle of analysis right now, so I, I'm hesitant to say, I'm We're hesitant not gonna to, hold you to say it. anything, but, uh, for example, there's a, um, the girls that I work with that are in jail, there are quantitative surveys that they fill out for us about how they're doing. Their poems will go into different detail about what's going on in their lives. So I can't give like a specific example, but there might be, you know, an adverse childhood experiences questionnaire. Has this ever happened to you? And they might say no in that questionnaire, but they're writing a poem and it's clear that something like that has happened mm -hmm. to them. And they weren't able maybe to identify with the language of the survey. Um, and they, or maybe they were lying because surveys are weird and they, they feel very intrusive and very clinical and you just don't want to give who, who's the survey for? Who's seeing this? Yeah, but when yeah. I'm writing a poem, I'm just writing it for Tasha yep. and she's a creative writer and we're just doing this arts thing. And so they're able to share something in a way that they don't think is weird or, um, or going to be used or exploited because it's not. <laughs> um, so they can share some things and then as a facility... Um, the detention center and then as a city we can start looking at what's actually gone, going on with young women versus um, what we maybe think that is going on because we've chosen to ask certain questions and they've given us certain answers we can mm -hmm. only provide the resources that we know are needed and sometimes we don't even provide those right, but right. Um, what if we knew a whole bunch more about what was going on in their lives Do you, are you thinking yet about what this work can become after you graduate? Uh, <laughs> I haven't had capacity to think too much about that. I, I do know that I'm also interested in something called futures literacy and how do you help people learn how to imagine different types of futures and what role that might play in public health and what role the arts would play in futures literacy. Um, but I think that all these things are sort of connected. I think that the, not just the arts, but just having more options for how we talk to one another, I think is really important. Mm. And the arts being one of the primary ways that I think about that, because that's my background. But um, sure. when we stop thinking that you have to talk really linearly, or when you have to be able to narrate something like a documentary, when you open up other options, how is it that you can communicate what's happening in your very human and weird nuanced life? Because it takes more than just ABC. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Justin, talk a little bit about what you're doing right now because you're doing fun things you just <laughs> you just finished a record with kim taylor i did i did i'm so grateful for that uh we're gonna uh i think have kim on the distiller around the end of the year she oh, and i are wonderful. talking about it so uh -huh. like we'll talk about the record and wonderful. we'll talk about you and you won't be there oh sure but um <laughs> but talk about that and other things that you're you're spending still some time on the road with ben soli i did yeah like, just Talk about what you're doing now and how that how that fits into this process and this discussion. Yeah, so a lot of it's been. Um, I'm working a lot more with. I'm working with a few 
companies that right now are delivering for what uh, that are making content for what they call digital. Digital is supposed to you know broadcast or features or whatever. But so can you name I'm working anything? A lot. That, yeah, like certainly. The, on? With working with a, a lot of things with the a website, Funny or Die. A lot mm-hmm. of the content that they make. Working with another series that's on YouTube for different things, and and it, it's um, it's gr- great. Uh, that I, I've talked to you, Brandon, about this, but it, there's kind of a magic of working on whether it's music production or whether it's uh, you know uh, video or TV or whatever. Of finding something start to sound like a what uh, I'll call in quotation marks a real thing. Yeah. Like it sounds like a real show. It sounds like a real whatever and. That's really gratifying, and 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 it's my my. I, th- I feel like there's a way my interest is always around the voice, like the, around like in a song, you know, uh, the, whether that's live. You know, I, I worked with the, the 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 artists I work with tend to be, you know, it has to do a lot with the lyrics that they're communicating and, and trying to create, you know, the appropriate mood for that and letting those be, uh, letting those finding a way for those lyrics to connect, and. Uh, yeah, for these programs, it's it's interesting. It's I feel like it's all it all has to do with all, all of the work that I'm doing. Whatever these venues have to do with, you know, the the content of of whether it's a show or or a song, um, that content connecting with the audience, the intended audience, the audience broader than that, in the way that maybe the artist is interested in. And 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 I'm really interested in. Uh, you know, obviously all of that, but also what what that artist is interested in, not telling them what they maybe they should do, but interested in hearing what they think about it and, and how to do that. And and a fun thing, I think, for production or things that I'm doing that is kind of like, how can I, you know, I like finding like, what's an easy way, how can I be an easy way to hire? Like, what, what things do they need? What things do they need help with? What things do they need, uh, you know, addressed? It, it, having worked at Lightborn, I was on the position of hiring lots of people and yeah. having the experience of those people that I hired. And it's fun being on the other side now from that perspective. The same thing from being an artist, Hesh, and I made records for a long time, and now being the person that's helping someone else make a record, what that's, uh, in, in, how that's informed things, and kind of like how, how I can help, I guess, honor, honor people and honor their intention and, and, and that that be communicated out the other side and in a way that sounds fucking awesome <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> And you are both, after, after not doing it for a while, I don't know if you ever thought that Ellery was done done or, uh, or if you ever even talked about it, but whether, uh, so you can answer that, but you yeah. are still writing and are still making music together after a period of not doing it for a while. I think we had an interesting thing where we tried regularly. Tasha never stopped writing songs. I never stopped doing production. But it would start to, it would feel bad. We, we recognized, I think, a part of stopping with Ellery was we recognized what the bad, the bad was. I uh-huh. like, use the bad in quotation marks. And we'd start to feel the bad. We'd start to feel those pressures or weird things that we were putting on ourselves. And we would always stop. It took us seven years, I think. To, we made a, a little EP last year. And I think it took us seven years to get to the point where we could work on something and it feel really good. And even for the majority of that process, I couldn't call it el- like on, on my. The folders on my computer, it says Justin and Tasha song. I couldn't even call it Ellery for it <laughs> yeah. without it bringing back. It's kind of like people say, like, you can't, when you don't forget how to ride a bicycle. And you're like, what if you want to, though? Like, what if you have to forget how to ride the bicycle <laughs> oh, in order question. to enjoy it yeah. again? And so when we would go back to, like, recording with Ellery, it was sort of like getting back on the bicycle that we didn't want to be on. And like, how do, but how do we do this exact same thing, but not have it feel like that or not step into these old roles or these old vibes that we were trying to get rid of? So yeah, it took a really long time. It turns out it takes a really long time to forget how to ride a bicycle. Ride a bike. Well, what, what, what was it? Was there something that you changed or was it just that enough time had passed? Oh no, it was a lot of, it may not be quantifiable in the things that, there was a lot of Heavy hard work, counselor change, a lot of un, yeah. unshouldering, yeah. Uh, external pressures, pressures that all, lots of pressures that we put on ourselves. Yeah. Have you changed the way that you work together creatively from the way that you used to? I think, in a way, um, I think that Justin, for whatever like his needs were at the time, I think that you know the songs became Tasha's songs instead of Ellery's songs a lot of times. And I think that that did shift a little bit the way that we worked together and that he felt more like, I mean, just like what he's talked about, that he was 
um, helping me execute my vision for a song versus him being on the hook for also having a, a, an exactly equal vision for that same song. And, and I think that that maybe helps to um, create a different dynamic in the way that we're working together, a little bit more like Justin as the producer and partner versus like Justin as the person who thought that he was also producing himself, mm. which gave it a different sense, I think, when you were doing the work. In a, in a, in a on the face way, it's fun, actually, and we enjoy <laughs> not, it. Not work. And we don't fight each other as much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, and just really enjoy it. There is something about, I mean, when you take the pressure off something having to be your livelihood and you let it be a creative oh endeavor yeah. and you allow it to be fun. Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine music being fun. <laughs> it, was, it was something that we, it was a lot of yeah. reconnecting with things. Yeah from, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. And I had wanted to say earlier, like, because I wish that somebody, somebody probably did say this and I didn't, wasn't able to hear it. But as an artist, I had a lot of shame around the fact that I needed financial security and that was something that I even wanted. Um, and I felt like I should be okay with, I remember being a child and saying like, mom, I will eat bologna sandwiches for the rest of my life if it means that I can be a singer and tour hmm. the world. And so I had a lot of shame around the fact that I couldn't still say that same kind of, make that same kind of quote unquote sacrifice. So I just wanted to like be able to give voice to the idea that like, you know, there's no shame, like whatever it is that you need, you're allowed to pursue and you can still be an artist and have a nine to five job and you can still be an artist and need to have your bills paid. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's, I know that you and I have talked about this, Justin, I'm not sure if the three of us have talked about this. There's a there's a train of thought that I've sort of been chewing on for yeah. about a decade. Yeah. Um, about um, about celebrity in general in our culture mm -hmm. and the expectations that it creates and what it does to people. And one of the one of the many things that I have seen in my interactions, because when when we first met, for people yeah. that don't know this, I was tour managing a band that Tasha and Justin were opening up for. Yeah. Um, and we spent a little bit of time on the road, and that was 10, a long time 10 ago. years ago ish. <laughs> I don't know what um, it was. Yeah. And I have seen uh, in my time in radio and in my time in the music industry so many miserable people yeah. who could not admit that they were only doing what they were doing because they were supposed to be happy with it, because right. they were supposed to feel lucky that they were getting the chance to do it and because they were supposed to feel like rock stars. Yeah. And they were miserable. Yeah. And it's like so many of those people you just want to go up to and sort of pat on the back and say, you know, it's okay yeah. to stop. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And we have this idea that like, yeah, there, like, there's a sexy element to it. But there's also this lie that that if you consider yourself creator or if you're a musician right. uh, or an artist of any type, that the only way to be valuable as a person is to, is to live this life of great miserable sacrifice <laughs> and that there's a nobility to that. Yeah. Yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. There's like, be okay, be happy, take care yeah. of yourself, like recognize right. that you're depressed and go home. Like that's the thing that's noble, hmm. not living some lie of, of the starving yeah. artist you know, I just, there's yeah. so much wrapped up in that for us culturally that people have to go out. And that's why people die. Yeah. That's why it's true. famous people kill themselves, drug themselves to death is because that life is so miserable so much of the time, but they don't mm -hmm. feel like they have permission to do anything else. And that's not to say that there aren't people out there that have figured it out and that are doing it and that are happy right. Right. And, and more power to them. But there are a lot of people out there who are handcuffed by the idea that they have to be thankful for this miserable life yeah. that they have and couldn't possibly do something else. So sorry for the right. tangent and the no. soapbox, but... No, that's... It's very true. That's, that's, how, that's how I felt, absolutely. And, you know, that's why it was so hard to make a decision to stop because I thought, like, I would be miserable and I thought, you know, I, there is a certain level of misery that I feel in being uncertain, but it could not possibly equal the misery that I will have not doing this anymore. Right. And um, so there's a lot of self-deception and, and um, just not knowing like you 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 only know what you know you can only um yeah. testify yeah. to the experiences that you've had and what if you did step away and you realize that that was better like you can't know yeah one of the one of the things that i don't think we've delved into on the show enough and could 
is the forces culturally that that chain us to the things that we feel like we're supposed to do. Oh yeah. <laughs> when I worked in the advertising agency uh, that I worked in for years, like at that time, it was a horrible place to be. It was mm. a it was a place that people were working 70, 80 hour weeks. Nobody felt like they had the the personal power to make a change in their lives, mm. and the culture of that place at the time fed that. Yeah. It's going to be worse if you go somewhere else, you know, or aren't we great because we're in advertising and we're, and we're making things that people see mm -hmm. on TV? No. And, and universally, if you talk to the people who left that place at the time, <laughs> all of them were in a better place for having left. And yeah. I think there are so many, this has to be balanced with the discussion of, of access Sure. And the fact that a lot of people don't, don't have the ability to make a choice. Right. But there are a lot of people who do have agency in their mm -hmm. lives who, who have been told that they couldn't possibly make a change because of economic forces or because of shame or because of the expectations of family or because what they do is supposed to be something that they feel lucky doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, that's, there's, a, there's a big unhealthy mass there about how we shame people into staying in bad situations completely separate from the from the question of how we provide greater opportunity to people don't who don't have it right yeah. but how we tell people that do have that opportunity that they don't or that they should be ashamed of wanting something different yeah even yeah. if what they want is something more humble yeah right right yeah and there's a, such a interesting way that you know, we were just talking this morning about like what would be different if we didn't have to, you know, I'm in public health, so what would be different if we didn't have to think about how every decision affects our ability to take care of our health? Yeah. How is this decision going to affect my health insurance or how is this decision going to affect my ability to access care that I need? And, um, and so that goes, and that goes both directions because as an artist, like we had, we were lucky to have um, individual paid or insurance that was kind of decent, but kind of wasn't. It certainly wasn't good enough to where, like, if I just felt like I needed a mental health checkup, I would go to the doctor. No way. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of artists who are in that situation. But then people who are who have a some different kind of job, like where Justin was working, where there is good insurance, and like, oh, can I stop doing that because maybe I won't be able to take right. care of myself? And uh, right. Yeah, that affects access in so many different ways. Yep. So maybe final final question. Um, your your relationship. Mm. How has it changed given all of this and where you are right now? How do you feel that you are able to support each other in in what you're doing, and how has that morphed over the years? Hmm. I think it has definitely changed. I think I would need like time to think about uh, to describe it, like all the different. I think there are ways. Dra where drastically, we've told people we've been married a very long time, and we've told people that we're very lucky that over that time, you become very different people, and we're lucky that we have kept liking the other person, who the other person is becoming, because that's certainly not the guaranteed. new different person. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. been. Yeah, it feels like it's not just one change. It's been many changes a lot mm -hmm. of gradual but sometimes very rapid change and I think that we've been very open to the other person who they're becoming and, and, and trying to I think open has been a thing trying to be non-judgmental to them and, and to be honest I'll let, you know also like you know a lot of like therapy and a lot of like yeah. you know a lot of hard work and, and sad or bad times and, and uh, yeah, that openness that's resulted in a lot of like deep good. Hmm. Like I think that the tangle of our career and our partnership being mixed up together for such a long time um, meant that I felt a lot of responsibility not only for the success of the venture, but for the happiness of my partner and for how we were doing everything together. And so I think that a, a big change has been like that moving away from that career offered a big change that that offered was that um i'm able to see like it is it is my responsibility to love and care for justin but it is not my responsibility to make sure that he's happy and the other way around and that that's actually a a false chase anyway like you cannot yeah. you cannot make sure that any other human being is happy all you can do is um is be present for them but i think the sense that you can and the constant chasing after that causes a lot of um of strain and mess that uh yeah, I think that both of us learning that we can we can take care of each other, but also be responsible for taking care of ourselves. 
This has been a really big gift. Right on. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, we probably need to get out of here before the five o'clock crowd <laughs> rolls in, <laughs> if it could possibly get any any louder. Uh, but I really have loved talking to you both about this, and thanks thank for you, your Brandon. honesty and your candor and in, in sharing your process so far. Thank you thank so you. much. Appreciate Love it. Love it. Thank you both. Thank you. Just a quick note, stick around, and right after the credits, we will play the entire song, Tennessee Whiskey, off Ellery's 2017 EP, Overland Oversea. But first, this episode of The Distiller was recorded live at the Monic Beer Company, 1036 East Burnett Avenue in Louisville, Kentucky. Thanks again to Nick and the entire crew at Monic for taking such good care of us. The IPA at Monic, totally worth traveling for, and there's nothing on the menu I haven't loved. So if you're in Louisville or traveling through on the way somewhere else, stop by, say hi to the crew, and let them know you heard about it on the Distiller Podcast. You can also find links to Monic's website and Facebook and Instagram pages on our website at thedistillerpodcast.com. And of course, huge thanks to Tasha and Justin Golden, the creative forces behind Ellery, and now doing so much other good work in the world. We've tried to link to a lot of it on our website. We have links to ellerymusic.com and to the Ellery Facebook page, and also to Tasha's website, tashagolden.com, where you can read about her research at the University of Louisville, and you can read about and buy her book of poems, Once You Had Hands, from 2015. We also link to Justin's website, justingolden.com, where you can hear and learn more about his audio engineering and production work. Speaking of which, The Distiller is produced, recorded, and hosted by me, Brandon Dawson, with co-production and booking from Terry Heist. Our show is mixed and edited by Justin Golden. Thank you, Justin. Our logo was designed by Scott Ryan, and our videos are by Mike Helm of Minute Moments Pictures. You can find The Distiller wherever you find podcasts, wherever that is, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. Please click the subscribe button to be notified when new episodes are released. And if you like what we're doing, please tell your friends. The easiest way to do that is to follow and share our posts on Facebook and Instagram. And if you could also rate and review The Distiller wherever you listen, that is huge for us because every one of those ratings sort of raises us in the search results. Um, So thank you for that. Remember, you can listen and download every episode of The Distiller and find information including links, photos of the guests, and a map of all the show locations and get in touch with us all at thedistillerpodcast.com. You can also email us. It's mail at thedistillerpodcast.com. Tell us who you think should be on The Distiller to talk about their search for meaningful work, where you think we should record the show, or what you think of the questions we're bringing up and what you think we should discuss in future episodes. Whether by email, on the website, or on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, we always love to hear from you. And finally, we wanted to give you a taste of Tasha and Justin's musical collaboration. So to close this episode, here is the song Tennessee Whiskey off their 2017 EP, Overland Oversea. And again, you can link to their website where you can download the EP and find their previous releases as well from our website. Listen and enjoy. And until next time, as always, thanks for listening to The Distiller. Bye-bye.